Hi everyone, and welcome back to Balkansis, the show that's going to help you navigate the massive challenges of life, motherhood, culture, identity, and belonging with more ease, acceptance, joy, and purpose. Thanks to each and every one of you that come back every time to listen, learn, heal, and feel inspired. If you do love the podcast, then do me a huge favor and hit the subscribe button. It really does help spread the word. Hello, my beautiful Balkan sisters and brothers. Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Balkan Sis. It has been a while since I have come on here and um, recorded an episode. It, yeah, there's been lots going on, lots going on behind the scenes. Um, and that is life, right? <laughs> Things happen. Uh, we get sick. Kids get sick. And um, we get a little bit overwhelmed and uh, then you sort of have to take a step back and just reassess and start from scratch and, yeah, rebuild yourself again. And there's been lots of that happening and I don't know if you can hear in the background, but that's my little puppy. So if you would have listened to some of my last episodes from last year on Love and Loss, um, we sadly lost our, our two beautiful uh, German boxers, Bruno and Leah. And uh, yeah, it's been quite a journey since then, since last October to get to where we are now. And um, little Mina has joined the family. Uh, She's a Labrador cross American staffy and she's absolutely so, so, so sweet. And my little son is so, so, so happy. So is my hubby, my husband. And yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of new beginnings, a lot of celebrations this year, but also a lot of challenges uh, because with good times come difficulties and vice versa. So that's where I've been at in my life at the moment. And um, I've been in touch with this beautiful guest that I'm having on today for quite some time to uh, get her on the podcast. She um, is from Croatia, from Zagreb originally, and uh, she now lives in Sydney in in Australia. And um, yeah, I just love the Balkan connections that I get to make uh, with my Slavic women from all over the world. Um, There's literally listeners all over in Egypt, in Germany, in Italy. And I just want to say another thank you uh, for listening, for tuning in, for hitting the play button, for sharing the episodes uh, with your friends and your family. And I hope that you continue to do so um, because this is definitely a passion project of mine, something that I love creating. I've also been mentoring for the Croatian Women in Leadership. I've got three beautiful ladies that I'm mentoring. One is actually in Croatia. The other two are here in Australia. So it's been quite busy behind the scenes uh, with speaking and writing and running my businesses. Um, But I'm I'm so, so lucky. I'm so lucky that that I'm living this life that I'm living and that I got to cultivate um, a life, you know, that's, that's, full of joy and love and adventure and um, yeah, and obviously hurdles along the way too. And that's what I like to share. I don't only want to share the good times. I want to share the bad times too. But uh, wonderful Yelena, my my guest today, she's um, absolutely amazing. Um, you got <laughs> the dog. The dog just keeps on <laughs> barking in the background. <laughs> she's, she's, my concentration's like, what's going on? But uh, the wonderful Yelena, yeah, from a wartime nurse. Um, in the Balkans, you know, to a psychic healer, her extraordinary journey of transformation and healing is been absolutely pleasure to, you know, talk to her and connect with her and learn so much from her. And I attended one of her masterclasses on Facebook and I highly recommend that you jump on and you connect with her. And I really hope that today's episode resonates with you in some sort of way that it gives you hope, that it gives you bravery and courage to overcome any obstacles that you may be facing or have faced in the past or that you will face in the future. Um, because, you know, this is life and it just moves up and down. It's not one straight arrow, you know. And the more stories we share and um, commonalities that we share, the, the, I guess the easier it is. You know, when we know that we're not alone, 
life is definitely easier, you know, when we have the support and we're in a safe environment. Um, it can definitely be a game changer in our in our journey, you know, to becoming who we are and who we want to be. So I absolutely loved having Yelena on. Uh, look, we do discuss the war, um, you know, her time nursing in the war as well in the former Republic of Yugoslavia where she was a nurse. And uh, without giving too much away, obviously you have to listen to the episode itself, but we discuss domestic violence and, um, and, th- and you know, things of that nature. So, you know, if you're not ready to listen to that yet, that's absolutely okay. Uh, perhaps it's something that you can listen to in the future. So, um, you know, just pre-warning, I guess, uh, people, you know, if they're not ready to listen to it, uh, war, trauma, violence, um, but it's all in the name of hope and repair and recovery and restoration. So there's definitely a, um, you know, uplifting theme and uh, she shares so much of her journey and I share some of my journey as well, uh, being a child, you know, a small child in the war and we have a little bit of a cry and um, yeah, so I hope that you get to listen. I hope that you feel uplifted, that you feel inspired and that you know that there's hope, that there's light at the end of the tunnel, uh, that, you know, just one day at a time. You take those small steps, you know, just the small steps um, back home to yourself, you know, where, um, you know, you feel loved, you feel seen, you feel appreciated. And uh, there's definitely different ways that we can do that um, and tools that we can build upon with the help of other people, with mentors, with psychics, with healers, um, you know, that, that can help us get there essentially. So I think life wasn't meant to be done alone. And that's why I'm doing this podcast because you know, I want to build a community um, of just like-minded souls and I want to continue learning and growing and expanding. And it's a pleasure to have you here um, to be on this journey, um, all of us together. So I hope that you enjoy part one and part two um, of my episode with Yelena. Let me know what resonated and um, what hit home for you or any light bulb moments, feel free to share leave a review. Um, obviously, if you think that somebody will find it helpful as well, share with them. Uh, it is a free resource. And obviously, the more we spread it and talk about it, the more it will grow. And um, that's that's the whole aim, um, just to feel less alone, right? There's so much loneliness and anxiety and stress in the world that I just believe love and connection is always the answer. So I really hope that you enjoy it without going on for too long, because I've already been talking for way over time. Uh, the puppy's been distracting me. Let me know um, what you think on Facebook, on Instagram. Connect with me online. And I'm always open for a chat. Um, and, yeah, let me know what you guys want to hear more of um, or any guests. If you think you want to be a guest as well, reach out. If you have any recommendations, feel free to send them through. Um, I always love getting feedback from beautiful women all over the world. And, um I love that Balkan connection, you know, that, that threads us all together. You know, I think we're all made from the same cloth and, um, it's beautiful to share these stories and bring them to light because they've been in the dark for so long. So it's very fitting. I say light because her business is called healing light. And, uh, I really hope that you get some wisdom out of it. Um, you know, and that, yeah, it just, um, leads us all in a better direction. Um, just to being a happier and better and calmer, peaceful version of ourselves. Anyway, guys, my brothers and sisters, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day or the rest of your night, no matter where you are in the world. And I hope that you enjoy listening to the episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, WJ, bye. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome back to another episode of Balkan Sis. I'm so excited, and I don't know, you'll know people listen, but every time I say exactly the same thing, so people just think I'm constantly excited about everything. But I fucking am, because this is like my little passion project, and I'm so excited to have you on today. So for anybody who hasn't listened before or seen your pages or knows about you, I've got the beautiful Yelena Vukalovic here today. Um, there is so many ways to describe you and I don't even know, like you have so many gifts and so many talents. I'm just really stoked that you decided to come on and have a conversation today about all the wonderful things you've been through, all the wonderful things you're doing, all the wisdom that you have to share. And really just also for me personally, like just learning, you know, just learning and growing and evolving. So we're both really, really alike that way, but I'll let you do the introductions and, um, and then we'll roll on from there. 
Thank you, Ivana. Thank you for having me on your podcast. It's absolutely a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, yes, I'm Yelena, the energy healer from a little girl when um, I realized that I've got energy in my hands and I could have do healing, but I didn't understand it completely. And yes, I see people who cross over, see the spirits, and um, I, I do transformational mindset through the inner child and the trauma in people transferring that or transmuting it from the trauma from your inner child, want the child into empowerment and embodying you instead of yourself. I think it's awesome because you have such a rich history in like nursing through the wartime. It's like, since you're a little girl, you were called like Vyashtitsa, little witch, you know, all those sort of things, which is, oh my God, such a Vulcan thing. It's like, oh, I need somebody different. Let's just call her a fucking witch, you know? So you can swear, here's your permission slip today, but Basically, it's like you went from, you know, being uh, a nurse in the medical field and nursing through the war to being an energy healer, like obviously doing, you know, Reiki and healing some people. You're a psychic as well and like in a, in a child and, tr and all the things that I think are really coming through now in society is like such great timing for all the things that you do. But before we reach the top of the mountain to what you do now, um, Take us back to your Balkan story and, you know, little Yelena, where she grew up, where she was born and what life was like. Okay. So I grew up in Zagreb, capital city of Croatia, um, born and raised over there. And um, with a mum and dad, mum and dad are only children. So no, not with a big, huge family at all. Um, having my um, little sister, her name is Ivana too, so I had to giggle. Um, you know, and I had two half sisters. So we grew up like that. We had, um, country home close to Bosnia. Um, so, um, I love spending time in nature. My dad and I absolutely hated concrete and asphalt, you know, he hated, mm. um, you know, so we loved going to the country home, going hunting, fishing, and just all the produce from the cellar. Um, absolutely love that. So, um, that's how I grew up and, um. As a little girl, yes, we called yes, it's all the time because I could see things. I could see that something's going to happen or what's going to happen or, you know, so it's always like my, my little sister, she would always go like, yes, it's all, what do you have to say now? Uh, or my dad would have called me Lucrezia or because I was always making some potions and lotions of, you know, little mud or bugs in a, in a, in a nature, picked it up like, you know, quarter you know, leash chair, all of these things from the nature. So, um, and he was like, Sasadradish, you know what I mean? Like, you're going to poison us with something. And I'm like, no, I'm just inventing some. Guys, I'm making <laughs> birthing him. Fucking relax. <laughs> my dad was like, oh my God, what are you doing now? I'm like, well, like I do. And so I always loved spending time in nature. Didn't like the concrete walls. Um, I love the nature. I love sitting in the nature, being in the nature. So, um, yeah. And I love, I love seeing I would say nature, but biology of it, the cells, the changes in people, changes mm -hmm. inside. So in school, in primary school in Zagreb, um, we had um, competitions on biologia, you know. So during the Yugoslavia time, I came third and first in it, in um, Osman Mashkola. So I was um, having photographic memory, which was really good. So you just kind of read and remember things. Um, and I loved that, absolutely loved that. And from there, went to do study nursing. So, because I wanted to help people, didn't understand why I wanted to help people. And why mm -hmm. was that urge to help people and get them better and not to see them suffering. Um, and then the war started. So then the whole life changed upside down completely. Yeah. Um, yes. So your life sort of went from being this like a nice sort of nature driven I, I remember it as being calm as well. Like I, I really, I, you know, I often look back and reflect and even my sister says, you know, even I like, we had the best childhood and like, we really did. And, you know, often we'll say, she's like, who raised us? And I'm like the birds and the bees, you know, like nature did. And it's like, cause I don't remember my mum like sitting on the floor and playing or necessarily my dad kicking a ball or, but it was, I remember neighbors, Kulobi, like my uncle yep. was my aunties. Like I remember that, that just that feeling. Like you said, nature, like livada, greenery, like flowers, as we could flower crowns with my sister, it's beautiful. And to repeat back on what you were saying with the potions and all these things that you're doing, you know, people often refer to that as like, ah, oh, yes, it's a witch. But there's so many, I talk to my mum about this all the time, you know, and I don't know why they, people think it's myths or it's not real, but it is because it happened so much, especially in that time, like with the Treba Ben, the Ba Ben, the Tetke, they all had these techniques or this knowledge yeah. that 
they didn't study for, you know, like my mom, she was having issues, something like she, I don't know if she, she couldn't fall pregnant or something was with her belly or her ovaries oh. and her tent car like came and did this like binding thing with like national yeah. stuff like a stomach, she like tied it tight, she'd done a bunch of massage, she'd done a bunch of things. And the next, you know, like my mom falls pregnant and never had issues ever again with that. So, you know, they had this knowledge and this knowing they got just passed down to them from yep. from previous generations. I don't know at what stage that stopped. Why do you think there's such a bias to it now? I, I think so that it stopped maybe in a way of, you know, communism or when probably people being so scared, you know, mm-hmm. if we have this card or, or things and it's just like, it can't be. And I think so maybe in Australia, like it's more like we want to fit into this society, whatever. So we kind of hide from it because what's people going to think, you know, like, mm-hmm. um, I know that like from my ex-husband, like he was like that. He's gone like, don't talk about it. Don't do this. Don't say anything. Just be quiet about it. You know what I mean? So, you know, mm-hmm. maybe that, um, but my mom, when she was, um, when I was little, she was going to see Bionetica Chari. That's what it was called mm-hmm. over there. And, um, they said to her. This is how mum realized that, you know, I've got this in me. And they said to her, well, you have a little one there who is like us. Mm. And then they done something on my hands. And then I was like, okay. And I'm like, I, I can see the shapes. I can see the, you know, the energy and stuff into it. But during the communism, there was no book. There was no mentor. There was no one to say to you. There was no Google. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's I put in and see it what it mm-hmm. is, and I could not actually study or have a mentor to tell me what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. So that's how it was really funny when I was studying nursing, and I would go to the hospital, and I would go, "This is wrong with this patient," or "This is what's happening." Especially during the wartime when there was no electricity, I'm like going, "They've got this issue or whatever," and the doctor would just look at me, and go like, "Are you normal?" Mm-hmm. And then when it comes true, then it was like, "Okay, call Yelena." He was always mm-hmm. like, call mm-hmm. Yelena, where is she in the hospital? Call Yelena mm-hmm. to find her. Like, which was really funny. And in a sense, they didn't call me Viestic that. They just go, call Yelena. That's it. Yeah. I think the whole hospital on you if they say, call Yelena, which Yelena they're talking about. And it's interesting how something that's such a gift can also become in a way such a burden, not a burden, but like it can become this thing of like, it can, you know, it's like, it's like you'll, you become this go-to person, which is a lot to yeah. carry. It's a lot to... How, go back to the wartime if, if you want to, if you feel like you can, because this is very, there's not, there is, there is a lot of us, but at the same time, there's not that many of us here on the Gold Coast anyway. And obviously in Sydney, a different story, big yeah. community. How sort of, how was that for you moving through that? What age were you and, and when it all started and what, what were the feelings? What were things that you were going through? Like what the notions, the emotions, like, where am I going to end up? What's happening? What, or was it just like a, you know, survival? Like, take us back to that time if you can. No worries. Um, I can't do that. Like, even now, like, look, hold on, and I still get a goosebumps, even completely upset with goosebumps mm-hmm. on my hands. Um, you know, they will always leave that little things of, um, you know, residue on your body with that. So how was that um, when you're 14, starting doing nursing over there, it's totally different. You know, when you start doing the nursing, you are much more younger. Um, it's incredible how my parents had us ready. Something happens because that was in a war. Um, he went to um, in a war and no mob, no mobifil, you know, no mobile, nothing. And you just knew if something happens, this is where we're moving. We're going to Vienna, to Bitch. Um, this is how it's escape route. Um, and I was in a hospital predominantly with my coma because my class, my coma was in a hospital too. She was anesthesiologist and, um, it was like, okay, you're going to go with the hospital with, you know, hit the promotes and everything. And you're moving with that. So we had escape route to know, mm-hmm. and this was every day you just knew this. And if it's, um, you know, the sirens were on because like it was bombarded too, um, you would know what to do. I can't explain in any other way. Like kids just, we knew there was no, you go here, you go there and you come back and you just knew, um, you know, go to the basement, all of those things like hide. Um, it was incredible, incredible, you know, the resilience what we had to build for ourselves. Um, nursing in a hospital at the time, if you ever watched the show match, that's understatement how it looked like, even in Zagreb, little on in, you know, outskirts of, you know, you know, Zagreb, not Zagreb, but Croatia, you know what I mean? The hospitals, that was even harder over there where there was no electricity. You bowled the instruments in a pot and on, on over the boiling water. Um, you had no gloves. 
three quarters of the time, my mum was getting gloves from Germany when she caught like with a ship fence and stuff for us. So operating with you know, no gloves on your hands. Mm-hmm. Um, literally, I couldn't say I had my hands in the people because I literally did, you know, without mm-hmm. no gloves. Um, and um, you're sitting in a hospital for days to end by the time you can go home. Um, my mum would always say this to me um, back then. I was like on a coffee carver all day long she's like is anything running inside of your blood veins except coffee like there's no there is no blood running for you mm. there's just carver mm. um you know so and i don't know we just survived mm. i will say this for like five years we survived and when the war finished that was okay the war is finished then we're just like okay and what happens mm. now none of us didn't know what to do how to deal with that nothing the hospital Put it this way, I will say this, um, helicopter, even today's day, even when my son joined the army, I was like, okay, um, I see it and I still get goosebumps because the soldiers, the wounded people, the, the civilians would have come in with um, some of them with the helicopters to the hospital and you knew if they're coming with that, that's the worst case of scenarios, what you would get. Um, concentration camp people, when they were released, they would have come like that too. Um, and that was, that's, that was just really like shocking to see it and to actually experience something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, when you get a pair of boots and you just get the little tags and you just, you know what I mean? And they're just like, okay, we just have to, you know, notify people, things like that. Um, cause the tracing camp, men and women, that was, that was just the most shocking thing to yeah. experience that, um, yeah. you know, to see them, to, to I didn't even know like even now like it's still speechless to remember what do I even say to them how do I even do things and nobody didn't train us because there was nothing nobody could have trained us for it how could you get trained for it um you know now I know what I would do but back then that was like you just didn't know what to do Mm. so you spent uh sorry I got emotional when you were Mm. brings back a lot of memories as well and uh, but yeah um so for you, I mean, from like 14 to 17, pretty much, you grew Jack. up in the war. You yeah. spent like your most formative years during the a war nursing other people, like nursing, like you're on the other end of the tragedy. Yeah. Like you're, there's so many, there's so many layers to it, obviously, people yeah. on the front Forget line, the people in the middle. Look at the goosebumps. Oh, look, you know, why, the reason why I want to talk about these things is because I feel like these stories need to come to life. Yep. And just because it's tragic and it's sad and it's emotional and it brings back memories, it doesn't mean we should just bury it and be like, well, it's just no. something that happened. And, it, and I want, and I've even told my mum, which I have a hard time with getting my parents to open up about these things. And I said to my mum, mum, please, you know, oh, well, we're at the shops. My mum's like going off, oh, yeah, oh, I'm all the law. Like she's just talk, in motion, she's just talking about it. But if I was to get her in a sit down thing, she's like, she's not the car, she's be a lot of that's that. You know, and I'm like, mum these are the stories that need to be told of our people, of our ancestors. Like, this is what's important, like bringing this to life. Because it's as if, it makes me feel like it's as if our war didn't even happen. It's like, we're all just here floating in fucking thin, thin air. And it's like, it just didn't even happen because no one even talks about it. It's like, yeah, we're out, we're out, that's nice. Because just that survival instinct, you know? But when you talked about the escape plan, I just, ah, uh, you know, it's like my mom used to keep our shoes on. that She'd be yep. like, leave the shoes on, leave the runners on in case we have to run in the middle yeah. of the night and we're like going to sleep with like little shoes yeah, on. Have you been to your bed and everything? And do, you ever, like... do you ever just feel like it's an out-of-body experience? Because sometimes I feel like that wasn't yeah. even me. Like, I, I I'm, like, I'm like, who, who, what? It's like I'm here now in the comfortable environment with pretty things and I'm safe and I'm just like, is that? Sometimes I get so sad because I'm like, was that even my fucking life? Like, I can't even believe that somebody would go through that, let alone me or you. Like, but it was yeah. us. Like, it just, it, yeah. for you, how did you sort of rationalize that when you were coming towards the end and you were obviously just in survival mode? That's why you're drinking coffee because what else are you going to do? There's no time to eat. Like, people are dying left, right, and center and injured, wounded. You didn't have time to eat. Like, my mum would say, when was the last one when you ate? And I'm like, mum, I don't know. Because I was in surgery, like, at the time, because it was such a shortage, obviously, and if the you know, the sirens are on, you can't get a new staff in because they can't come into hospital. They can't walk on the road to come to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So you were there. And mum's like, when was the last one when you ate? And I'm like, I don't know. If I came after two or three days and I was that exhausted, I would just literally fall asleep in my bed with the clothes on. 
yeah. um, full-on uniform on. And I was like, mom, don't even ask me. Just, I really, I don't have strength to eat. So like lots of times, you know, I will say this in a hospital, like there was no sailing, you know, like there was no medications. There was like devastations. Like people would be dying from, you know, complication of a surgery in a way of complication was like, uh, there was no antibiotics. There was nothing to give them. And I was like, okay, we really need to go to the nature, dig at the roots. Lucky I was doing the potions and it's like, okay, dig at the roots because, you know, these roots can help up for the bacteria and infections and stuff like that. And I was like, we need to do something, but we couldn't do that for everyone because like, hello, dude, the sirens, you couldn't be walking around the park or eat and just dig out the roots and caught any daviza and all of this stuff, you know what I mean? What you need to go and get it out. But yeah, it was, it was shocking. You know what I mean? But I'm, I will say this, I'm always blessed when I remember those little children in a cot in a kinder bed and I would be sitting inside of the kinder bed with them and I'm like, you're not by yourself, even that they're sick and, you know, they're in hospital and I'm like, we'll be together. And the doctors would have always come in and like, where's Yelena in a kinder bed with the kids, you know? <laughs> because I'm like, well, they're scared, I'm petrified and I'm going like, how are we going to transfer? How are we going to move them all in the basement? And you have to, you have to move them. Children were always on the top on the top of the um, Zgrade in a building, you know, in a hospital. And we had to move them all the way to the basement, which is the hardest thing to move them all the way. Like, you no know, elevators, things like that. Okay, we have to move them. We have to carry them, you know, and we did that. I don't know how we did it. I have no idea how we did it. Yeah. So you spent, I mean, 14, 15, 16, 17, that was your your life, yeah. your reality. Like, what came, the childhood. what came after after that for you? What came after that, I went to study forensics at the uh, police academy in Zagreb um, because I somehow wanted to be moved from the hospital and the whole yeah. thing. And I wanted to some, somehow do something different. And again, this comes up with my gift, seeing the dead people and bringing things for them and bringing the family a closure, what happened and why did something happen? You know, obviously it's, you know, three quarters of the time it's a murder. So to find out what happened, why, and how to help them. Um, and then after that, I met my um, first husband and we got engaged, came here to Australia to get married. And then we went and lived still in Croatia. And then he said he could not deal with the corruption and all the things post-war over there. Um, and then we moved to Australia in 99. So, I so how old were you then when you came here in 99? I was 21. Wow. I was 21. Wow. I came here. So I was already married. Uh, a year married and um, yeah, came here to Australia. So we left the life where we lived there and um, we had our own apartment sold that we had a sailing boat. We sold a sailing boat, a car and um, we came here to live and I was so young and like freshly married and he wanted to move here and my mum was like, okay, so you just moved, you know? And I was mm. like, how am I going to move? So I went from one thing to another and did not even have a space to kind of they want to say think and absorb and process. Mm. There was no time for it at all. It just like it just happened. Wow, like, wow, like, that's huge. So from happened. like fourteen to twenty one, it was just bang, 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 bang. It was yep. just bang, bang, bang. Life as you knew it had just changed forever drastically, and all of a sudden you're like in this new place, in a new city, new, new, yep. new, new. Like just did, did you feel relieved, like you were coming to a new place, or was it more like oh, it's a chance to start all over again, or were you did you feel like I want, you know, you wanted to be still back in Zagreb. Um, I said, oh, I don't know what I was feeling because I have to say like from the trauma of the war and everything for the first, you know, for the next five years after that, I was still, um, you know, I would say not okay because like still the processing of the whole thing, um, mm. you know, you drop something on the floor for like literally until maybe five years ago, I would still like go and look and trying to duck you know, because mm -hmm. you're used to it, to that. Uh, so I don't know, like for the first five years, I was like, oh my goodness. But then I came here, everything was so different. The food was different. The people was different. Everything was like, you drive for one hour, you're still in Sydney. You drive for one hour over there, you're in Italy. Mm -hmm. You know, you go and see, you know, friends and family and things, or you go to Hungary, like, but oh, 15 minutes to Bosnia, like, mm -hmm. and I'm going like, oh my God. You know, so put it this way, when I came to Croatia and then my mum, I was going like, we're going to the outlet on the outskirts of Zagreb, yeah, to the shopping centre. 
And my mom goes, oh, it's 15, 20 minutes drive. And I say, yeah, that's okay, mom. It's not long. And she's like, I'm packing you up sandwich here, you know, for food. Mm-hmm. Did you have something mm-hmm. to eat? I'm like, mama, it's 15 minutes. Like, if anything, mm-hmm. it's 15 minutes in Australia. Oh, boy, he's like, like, yeah. he's like, he's like, um, I know what you mean. I know. I know what you mean. One hour, I'm like, I'm still in bloody Sydney. and didn't even do my groceries. <laughs> you know, I'm like, mama, I'm like. Look, it's a it's a different it's a different life. It's a, and, and I remember when we came here, I would like literally describe it as the wild wild west. We just felt like everything was very dry. The sky was really large and very like you could almost touch the sky. It was really weird and everything was very flat. Um, and the houses looked strange. And then the worst part was the 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 energy, the power outlet. It was like we couldn't use our fans. We couldn't, you know. I was like, that this yeah, looks weird. Good. Like, cause you're, you're up two holes in here. Like, just even those subtle little changes just shook you. But, and for the first five years, we just said we hated it. We hated it. We were like, Pobre Charlie, we were spewing, we were vomiting. We like had gastro. We were like sick. We were all a hot. Like we came in summer. We came out of winter. And my dad had to lie to me saying, we're just going on a holiday to see if we like it. If we don't, we'll go back because I threatened to run away. Uh, because once we saw where it was on the map, we were like, fuck that. Like, you know, whoa, you know, but my auntie was here. We saw the beach and the kangaroos. We thought, oh, there's Skippy in the backyard, you know, like there'd be kangaroos in the backyard. It's like just seeing the big lizards at the park. So yeah, Buck is just such, mom is like, I've come to like, you know, uh, alien land. It was like we landed on Mars or something. Like it was so <laughs> strange. It was like a fish out of water, you know, like I'm fishing a different pond and you were just like, I don't belong here. Like the t- things that the taste is different, everything, the music, the people, the mentality, and that level of adjusting is, is really hard. I think, especially for young people, I think for anybody really, honestly, to be honest on different levels, like, but for yeah. you, how did you sort of, you know, once you start to tie those experiences in now looking back and then obviously you became a mother as well, like a mom to two little kids. I mean, how, at what stage did your life actually just stop where you were able to like, did, did, did that ever happen or was it just survival? No. Keep on going. It was survival. Probably until like I had a divorce, like, like well, maybe just before then, then he actually kind of settled because, um, he was just like, I had, um, Josh, my firstborn, um, he was a hardcore three and a half years didn't sleep through the night. So like really, he, he, you know, like that was like, oh my goodness, you know? Um, but I was like, thank God that I'd done nursing before. So I was experienced with that and lack of sleep. So I survived the whole of that ordeal with him. Um, and then, um, four years later, Lara comes in and, um, yeah, and I was just busy being a mom and working and being a mom, having no family. So that was really challenging to have God's kids and you have no phone call to say, mom, come and help me with this. Mom, do this. The kids went to preschool. I went back to work and, um, yeah, that was really challenging. And then, you know, I kept, you know, saying to my husband, he's like, he said, we moved here for a better country. And I'm like, what's a better country? I have no one here. I have no one to help me. So my friends become my family, mm-hmm. um, you know, so who will help me and who today's day are my friends. And it's like, it's incredible. Like, you know, my best friend where she lived on the road in the same street, in you know, a park. And now like I was on, you know, 51, she was on 59. And I was like, I'm like, I can't believe it. Same street, you know, and um, we are friends and everything. So it's like, but yeah, no, it was so challenging, so challenging. Mm-hmm. And when like, from the war to bang, 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 like to have a children, move here. And everyone thought overseas that I moved to, I don't know where and what kind of country. So when my dad come here, he was so funny to get him through the border security. I thought we we're going to end up on a television show with him because I had to go and send him with two papers, one in English, one in Croatian, so they can call me because he was like, I can't bring salami. We make salami, prosciutto, everything at home. And he goes, I can't bring it. And I'm like, that's why you can't. Like, he goes, what's wrong with this country? And I'm like, please, can we not go over this? And I was like, I even now I've got a heart palpitation, like thinking about it how I was. And I was like, oh my God, we'll end up in jail. He's going to be turned around and he's going to be sent back because he's bringing parachute, he's bringing speck, he's bringing all this stuff, you know? Yeah, and I just got to say, like, all the fucking heavy shit we all been through as a collective, as a society, as a people, it's like our parents, our parents just fucking... They just, they just, uh, it, it's that, it's that, it's that scent. It's like something so minuscule, like a fucking salami, you know, can just send you over the edge. And like, that's the thing. It's like, 
I always say to my best friend Frankie, I'm like that dark sense of humor we all have. It's like it's so shared. It's common between. I, only I could understand that story of your dad trying to bring in salami from another country. Like to somebody else would be like, "Is this guy for real?" Like you know, we should come take food. It's a common a common knowledge. But without parents, common isn't so common. So it's oh, like. It's like, you know, when you're going to Gosta, you know, you go and visit Gosta, you bring some smoke, you yeah. know, pixel or something. Yeah. You know, people don't do that here. And oh, we do it. I do yeah. it obviously to my friends who are like our, you know, our background. But like over there, like when we live in Christchurch, we had the second house, like we can be so, you know what I mean? Like to have over there. And um, we made everything. So that's what was smoking fish, smoking mm. meat, making kubasitsa, making prashot, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know we just go yeah. to the shops to buy toilet paper people yeah. would ask me what you buy shops and i'm like i think it's just toilet paper i do yeah. not remember nothing as brasno came from me you know in cello yeah. uh you know like you know the in a cello they had our pigs and the cows you know they this lord my dad was teaching me how to do it all of it so i know how to do it all of it um you know make the kobasi say how to cut the meats everything and yeah i learned how to do it so when i came here to australia you're gonna laugh now so I didn't like dairy. It was like stale or like mm. did not taste nothing like mm. what I hear see or mm-hmm. nothing. So then I go and ask my tata, I call him up and I was, and he goes to me. He goes, just go and kill the rabbit and get the rabbit's stomach and put it in the echo. And I'm like, the fact that it's in Go and get a rabbit and chill. I'd like to someone spit, put it in bloody milk. Like and it's I'm like, like yeah. the gun. So I'm like. They don't have guns here. Like we had guns, obviously. Christ, cool. like grow up with the guns and everything mm-hmm. else. Like you know, Pushkin and all of these stuff. And you know, and he goes, "Look, just go kill the rabbit." I'm like, "That's all." I think I'm not. What do you need? And he goes, "My kakos is a tito zemlo zemila." You know that they don't have these. And I'm like, oh, God, "They don't." You know, we we used to clean like my pet my parents' gun at home. You know, like this big, big, bloody, I don't even, you know, I don't know if it's a rifle or one shot, I, I don't know. But it's like, I remember polishing it. And it's funny because I had this memory of us polishing this big gun. And I thought, nah, that's not, nah, so, that must be from a movie. I don't think that actually was me. And the mum was like, yeah, 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 you for push for Yeah, yeah, we did, we did. You, you know? I'm, and I'm like, what? oh, shit. Yeah, like, gun. yeah, that's the thing. Does your life ever feel like it was a movie? Like it's a movie? Yeah, like that. Not. It does. And you know what? When I brought my kids over, Josh was just finished six and Lara was, you know, in primary school. And my tata was like, you're going to last now. And I mean, hopefully nobody doesn't get offended with this. My tata goes like, so did Josh ever shoot from the guns, you know, in Australia, like a petite fishka? And I'm like, tata, he's Aussie kid. Like, you know, oh my God, stop to my one of beating. Don't want to say what they're saying. Like, yeah, then, you know. <laughs> And I'm like, what you like, he's not. Like, yeah. Your man, he goes in, a, and I told him, put all the guns in a house upstairs mm. that the kids don't see it because we have them hanging on the walls. You yeah. Know? It's a full hunting house, yeah, with the animal heads and everything in the house. And Tata goes like, Ma, he owned on S22 and air rifle for my kids, and they're shooting in the backyard. I'm like, it's just a bullshit. They're Asarovsky kids. Like, yeah. I've known him and they probably that. just think it's like the funnest thing ever. Like, this is so, they you know, to them, it's like. It. So how was it, how was it for you then with the kids? Because, you know, the, the matresses journey as I could call it, or like, you know, that, that passage that everybody walks through becoming a mum. it's that sacred path, you know, that you just know when that woman is going to enter that path, like my best friend right now, she's pregnant and there's nothing I have to say. She's going to walk the path. It's such a that she's going to see everything for herself. Right. And I'm just here to support and be there for her. And that's it, you know? But for you, how did you blend those two worlds? How did you, you know, the way you were parented, the way you are parenting, ha- and then also for you having no family support, but it's like you were, plus you were nursing. It's like, how, how did you get through that time for you? What were some of sort of the go-tos or things that you would do to keep yourself like sane? Sane. Um, <laughs> coffee. <laughs> I want some coffee. Yeah. I want some coffee. Plus we Josh. Um. It was, I have to say this, when they gave me Josh, um, I had a C-section with him, so, and I had trouble to wake up. So next day, literally, I woke up, um, they couldn't even properly wake me up on the day of it. And um, when they put Josh on my chest, I was like, oh, like, I know how to deal with a sick child, like in a hospital. I'm like, I'm having a healthy child. What do I do? It was like, that was really hard transition because I was so young and coming mm-hmm. from the war and I was 22 and a half when I had Josh. 
And because at the time I was already married for a couple of years and everyone was like, what, where's the grandson? Where's the grandson? You know, so mm-hmm. it has to be a child. And, um, that was really challenging for me to kind of transition from, you know, dealing with a hospital, dealing with a war. And then it's like, I've helped a child. What do I do? Because mm-hmm. on top of everything, I didn't have a childhood in, in a way of teenager. That whole time was like skipped to, I don't know, to like 300 years, like lightning years, you know, to go into this age where I just go like, I don't know how we did it. Wow. So yeah, it was really challenging. And then by the time I had Lara, I would say I was so much more relaxed. Mm-hmm. Um, but my son, you know, if you hear the stories, especially in my cousin's parenting classes, uh, when I say the stories, how he challenged me. And I was like, okay, but what do I have to do to learn? So I had a different approach, probably from my mother more than my dad, because my dad was like, it's black and white, that's it. You know what I mean? Where my mind was much more soft and going like, okay, obviously mom carried some of the gifts what I carry, but she still didn't understand everything. And I was like, if he's doing this, what do I do with that? And I wanted to have more patience. And mm-hmm. I know what I experienced during the war time. So I gave my children when everyone see me and they go like, you have so much patience. How do you do this? There's days when, you know, you are a little bit shorter on the patience. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, back then it was like, how can I be the best possible version of being a mom, still being assertive, still being, and I wanted to have a children where I can sit with them when they're grown ups at the table mm-hmm. and we talk and we can talk about everything and anything. And now they're 18 and 22 and that's exactly what happens. That's so beautiful. somehow I had that feeling that I knew that it's going to be challenging. I knew that it's going to have lots of things, but I was like, okay, what did I experience with my parents? What did I have? What of that I could learn? What did I like that I seen on my friends' parents? And I was like, I want to be more of that. Mm, I so just sort of adapting, of me. adapting a bit of the old and the new and sort of yeah. like still being firm and being their pillar and at the same time also being flexible and understanding and just merging those two worlds. I love that. One thing I want to highlight that you said, it's this, uh, I don't even know how to describe it only, I think we would all understand it, but it's like when something good happens to you, it's a foreign concept. Like this is the fucked up thing. It's like, so you're putting a healthy child on you and you're like, oh, what do I do? But like, do you know what I mean? It's like, we are the opposite of what most other people are. Like the other people would be like, Oh, healthy baby, great. Like moves on with life. And that for us, like, oh, healthy baby. It's like, oh, what the fuck do I do? Because you're so used to the yep. the trauma and this and the that. And like bad had things happening. Like I literally I had this happen to me last week, Yelena. That's why I jumped on that masterclass with you that you had on the Thursday night. And that week was so transformative for me. So it sort of all tied in perfectly. And I said to my husband, you know, about the dog thing and everything. And I did an episode where last year on love and loss and And I just like, I didn't care. I just went on there and I just bared my soul and I cried. And I'm like, you know what? Enough shying away when things happen to me or like, you know, when, yeah, things happen. It's like, this is life. So it's like, I'm not just not going to live. Like, I'm not just not going to record and still be productive, do things I love. Because usually I just go to a cave, I retreat and that's it, you know? But I thought, no, I don't want to be the person that just shares when shit's good. Like, I want to share as well when shit's bad. So this week, this happened like with the dog and I'm like, I'll go to the animal welfare league. We thought I will have a look. We had a look around, whatever, come home. And Andrew's like, so, and he saw this beautiful dog that we have now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I said, Andrew, I'll leave it to you. You make the decision. I'll be happy either way. Right. And he's like, all right. So he gets this dog. I like, I meet her at home. I start crying. Like I'm, I'm sobbing. And Andrew's like, are you happy? And I'm like, "I, I was like, so like. I'm scared to love something again because I'm going to lose it. It's going to die. And Andrew's like, but that's life. And I'm like, you don't understand. My heart can't take it anymore. My heart has been stretched. I'm stretched, stretched. I'm like, never will be shit. Like since I was six years old, that's all I've ever known. But Andrew's like, yeah. you have to, babe. You have to open up again. You have to open your heart. Like he's like, you have so much love to give. And I'm like, I do. And it's wasted if I don't give it. So it was actually so hard to like open myself up again to like, same way as you, it's like, oh, I have a healthy child. Why is that such a weird thing? <laughs> like, like that, that's actually a concept that not many people talk about. Like everyone talks about like, oh, you know, how do I manifest this? How do I this? How do I that? Like for me, I said to Andrew, I'm not scared to fail. I'm not scared of like this or that. Like I'm used to losing. I'm, I'm used to trauma. I'm used to that shit. That's what fucking jam. It's like when things are actually going my way. And the oh, doors are opening up for me. I'm fucking petrified. 
I'm like, I'm scared of success. I'm scared to live this great life because part of me thinks like I don't deserve it, but I do. Like, so mm-hmm. that's why I love about all the things you talk about. Like, and if you could sort of take us back through the motions on how you then progressed from your nursing journey to what you do now and all the things that happen in between that led you there. So you had the children that were young, you're still nursing. At what point did you have that break or that breakthrough or that aha moment? Or was it just a series of little moments? Uh, it was more of a series of a little moments. And I remember what my Dida would say to me. And um, it is so funny how you just, you know, remember things, what they would have done. And he loved lighthouses. Yeah. And he would have had, we would have so many lighthouses around the house. And he lived with us in Zagreb. And um, he always said to me, Elena, just be Svetionik, like a lighthouse, you know, and just shine your light, be your light. And if the broad comes in into Marina, like, you know, like that's it. And just be that. And that's what I was doing with my children, just being that and being always honest with them and telling them, mommy's having a hard time. Uh, like, for example, Christmas or my birthday was always a hard time for me um, because I miss my family. I miss snow you know like to have snow at the christmas it was like so wrong to have seen but i'm like what the hell seems like at christmas it was like so i told my ex-husband i'm like we need to have a real christmas tree at christmas so he had to go to fireman chop the tree because i can't believe i'm chopping the tree i'm like chop the tree i'm having plastic up and i'm like i need to smell something as a christmas something you know mm-hmm. so i brought all of the traditions to have got it at christmas and at birthdays, make a big um, thing about it, you know what I mean, of just celebrating because I was like, we need to celebrate life because life is short and, you know, um, like the war happened, like where my best friend went, I was 17 and that's why I went to do forensics because he committed suicide and I wanted to know why and what happens and stuff like that. Do with that. So, and, and that affected me a long time for like 20 years was affecting me and his mom a lot. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, you know, always be that lighthouse and little moments, make it up in a big moment and just treasure them because we had so many of not so good moments when we were younger that I wanted to treasure all these things. I think it makes you, it makes you appreciative. Uh, I think like I, I, I'm a crier, like I, I, I cry less now, which is a good thing. I'd be like an old man, just cried the drop of a hand. And then you'd be like, why are you crying again? And I was like, part of the tears wasn't actually always sadness. It was also gratitude. Yeah. Like I was on a boat with Andrew for the first time ever. Like we were not anywhere near the water. I grew up in the cellar. So when he took me out on this beautiful like boat, like he loves boats. He loves being on the ocean, on the water and the sun setting. And we're just together and he's looking at me. And I just had this like moment. I just started bawling. He's like, oh my God, are you having a good time? I'm like, yeah, so much. This is so beautiful. Like. Because I was having all these firsts in my life that, you know, people don't realize how significant that is. It's like such a small thing, but to you, it's such a big thing. Like how did all the trauma and, and all the hardship affect your relationships, like your romantic relationships, you would say, and even your friendships? Um, in a friendships, like I have to say, um, how can I say with a friendship? Like they're two different ones. So like friendship and romantics, um, friendship. I've got friends from a day one when I, you know, met them here and we are still friends. How many years later, 20 years plus later, we're still friends. And, you know, being cautious or not cautious, I'm not cautious. I always say this, that if it's, if they have something that will, it will show, if it's not in alignment with me, mm. it will show. I always kind of, and I just trust that. Mm. Um, in a romantic one, you know, my first marriage and that, um, you know, in a way, because what happened, what he did. And I was like, I'm not standing with that. And I walked away from it. Um, the second one, when I got married four months later, I ended up being, um, physically hurt, um, by him. Um, I mean, he's found guilty now and everything else. And so am I cautious after all of that, that it happened? Yeah, absolutely. Completely cautious with that. Um, so in that respect, um, I'm absolutely cautious mm. with the romantic stuff, but we're with the friends and we'll show things. Um, and, um, yeah. Why do, why do you think we, and I've been in, I was, you know, in an abusive relationship before Andrew as well. Like, why do you think we attract these people into our sphere? Like what, what do you think is that toxic bond or makes that toxic bond? 
not that anybody goes into a relationship thinking, oh, I deserve this. It's nothing like that. What I mean is, is like, how do we become like sort of witnesses to this, if that makes sense? It's like, cause I look back now and I think like, how, how did me, little old me, who's like really confident and assertive and have been a bubbly fucking end up in that. Like, obviously it can happen to anyone, but it's like, what was unresolved in me that was, that was asking for that lesson? So for me, what I look at it back in retrospective, like I was confident, I was doing my work. Like after the divorce, I got first one, I got, um, I opened up my business because he did what he did. And on the end of that, with the money and everything was really short, what he did, I'm not going to discuss all of that stuff, but I was left with, you know, paying the rent, having two kids. He paid $50 a week child support. And he said to me, you'll be hungry on the street. And I opened up my own business, started working somewhere else. And I done my work so what did that push me and so I was very confident very established my business was booming I was fine and I met this person during the time of the COVID it was sounded perfect everything was good and then this happened after we got married you know tables turned around and you know I had the strength to walk away from it um because I was like no there is red flags this is not right everything else and then I looked at it back, why did it happen? I look at it now. So when I have got clients to come in and I go like, you're on domestic violence, you've got this, you've got that. This is what I can help you. This is what you should be doing from the government or whatever. This is where, you know, you have to tell the police to do this because, you know, they're not doing it, X, Y, and Z, because of my experience. My experience is what I had. So I go like, okay, so I attracted this person to go and help. Literally every week, I've got at least one or two clients who come in and they're like, Yelena, I'm so afraid to walk away. And then I have broken bones like I've got you know three balls in this neck and shoulder injury from it and you know I'm like you have to go and do this this is what there is a help with it and everything else so for me I look at it as I went through that experience to help others Mm. because maybe they have no strength maybe you know they have got the things uh, you know and I'm the one who has no family and I walked away Mm. like I have no brothers I have no sisters I have no mum and dad here I've got my friends and if I didn't have them, like, yeah, it would be much more harder. But I had them and they go like, Yelena, we'll help you. We're here for you. Mm, you know, so, great. but in a sense, helped with the clients. The same as for you. Look, you're doing the podcast. We can go and talk about it because mm. we didn't go into that relationship, you know, because we were just like, I don't know. You know, there is a reason for it, why we went. And this is where I believe it's my reason for it. Mm. And I was super confident, super social butterfly, super, my business was booming. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was, everything was good. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that, I had a, I had a disease to please. Like I can personally look back on that experience where I had a disease to please and it stemmed back from the whole good girl thing. And I know it's like a trend now and it's, you know, and all these things that like trauma, good girl, all this stuff, but it really was, you know, I come from this authentic creation upbringing where it was like, you know, you treat a man a certain way and then, you know, you stick by people and loyalty is yep. loyalty. And, you know, it's like a promise is a promise. And, you know, when you commit, you commit, like you go all the way. So I was talking about the whole light switch, the black and white, like sometimes it serves you, sometimes it doesn't. So you need to know when to taper it on and off. But personally for me, it was like this whole disease to please where it was like keeping other people happy above my own needs. Um, and that's something that that's the lesson I had to learn, right? Like that was, that was the lesson. And unfortunately, sometimes it eventuates the way it does. Like there's only so much you can control from someone else. But to me, it just taught me like I needed to get my power back and it needed yep. to be back in my hands. So I love that you said that. And now that you can actually be a vessel as well of experience and wisdom and strength, like for other women as well, because sometimes we have to be that pillar of light also for others, you know, we become that channel. Yep, because yeah. I see things, what's going to happen through the psychic sessions, you know, mm. so even what happened in Sydney yesterday, I predicted that, you know, and, you know, another person who I told them, they sent me a message and say, this is what happened and here's a text message and, you know, and that happened yesterday in Bondi and I'm like, all what I see. So even the same thing with domestic violence, I see what's going to happen, why is it going to happen in their life and it's just giving them, okay, this is what you need to do. Mm-hmm. it's not just about seeing it but it's like yeah to deal with this and then when i see that the inner child wound is coming up and they're so scared i'm like there is help you can do this and i do want it that we get more education around that with everyone even including the police you know that can improve things that can improve mm-hmm. some systems because to me the system failed me so many times with my ex because you know until six times was believe being called when i was actually unconscious yeah. So it took that many, I would say the word goes, that it happened to me 
you know, that they didn't actually take any actions on it. And, you know, um, and the AVO really doesn't, um, uh, I would say the word protects you. You know what I mean? Oh, look, at the end of the day, if somebody wants to get to you, they'll get to you. No, no exactly. piece of paper or this or that is going to, you know, but the, bu the bureaucracy plays a huge part because there's only so much, like there's only so much we can do as people and then as a collective to raise the consciousness and the awareness and the knowledge around how we want to be treated and what's controlling, yep, what's not. There's only so much we can do, but it's also like a society thing, which is the systems need to uphold the changes that are happening within households. Right. If the system is like a fucking dinosaur age uh, and it's not moving along with the times, like what's serve, what, what does it serve? Nobody. What's the purpose of it? Nothing. And we fund that with our Nothing. taxpayer money. So, you know, it is like the case Sorry. of environment, like nature versus na uh, nurture, you know, because you can only nurture so much and, and lift people up and like give them these resources. But at the end of the day, like, okay, if they go and they meet a dead end, like what then, you know, they hit a brick wall. So I totally get it because yeah, I was in a similar situation when I ended up going to the police and they basically just said to me, it's your word against his and that's it. And oh. basically they just, they just thought I was a silly little young girl and they were just like, look, most of the time the women go back. So we don't do anything. I, I, and I, I did go that. back and I did go back. Uh, that's the fucking astounding thing. Like, it's like, I don't know how, I was such a sucker for punishment. Like I, I had, like I said, it's a sucker for punishment. Like, oh, I just keep like going back and having the same fucking problem. You, you go into it like, oh, you know, maybe he will change for me and maybe he will do things for me. I didn't go back. Like once when, you know, it was that thing done, obviously was done. He moved out and everything else. But then after he moved out, he done that, what he did mm. that I went unconscious, um, you know, so, um, you know, so, but yeah, even when the neighbors call up the police and, um, you know, they said to me, oh, we'll arrest him, we'll do this. And then, you know, he's back and he will have to come home and you can have ABO and live in the same house. And I'm like, how's that going to work? It's not going to work. He's going to generally like, don't want to say this, but like kill me, mm. you know? So, and that was like, you, uh, in my opinion, you can't be doing things like that. They can't be like going back to their home where they're living. They have to be completely moved out. And this is where a woman, where they said to me, don't you have family? Can't you just move there? And I'm like, I can't. Why would you like mm. to do that? Now? You know, and that's the hardest part what, you know, there is no actually kind of choices on that. Mm. And when you, going back on what you were saying with, you can see and feel things or like even predict things, um, how for others and in the world, how does that translate into your personal life? Like, can you also see and predict things that feel like in your personal life? Is it, is no. it's not there? Yeah, it's will just always, always, every psychic will say this to you. They stop things for you to see because then it, you're kind of not, you know, you're not living in a moment and you're not living in a flow and, you know, you can do this. So only thing what I can watch in is, is red flags, you know, green flag, black flags. Uh, I can watch, I can have a really as good friends, what I've got around me where I go and talk to them and discuss it. And they will say things, what they kind of feel or see, or they will watch on my back mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. but I can't be seeing things for myself. I That's can see right. things in sort of my own wounds or triggers in sort of my mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. I do, I feel them and I know them, but what am, do I see for myself? No. Yes. Not it's not as like clear vision as what it is no. out there. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. No. Yeah. Not at all. Yep. So I can't I do get that it. at all. Oh, myself. well, I can't wait to That's dive. Not... Like, I can't wait to dive deeper into that because we're going to go dive even deeper than what we have, even if that's possible, <laughs> when we do our part two, because this is our part one and I have so many good questions. So just stay on the line and we'll come back with part two. So that was the episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. And as ever, if you did, please consider sharing it with your loved ones and leaving me a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. It really does make a difference to the number of Balkan sisters that we can reach with the brilliant wisdom that my guests and I share. Thanks for being here. Idovijenia!